Are you an aspiring Jedi, or do you dabble with the dark side of the Force? Regardless of whether you fancy yourself a Defender of the Light or an aspiring Sith Lord, you're going to need a lightsaber. Podcast Stardust is pleased to partner with Saber Masters, the creators of high-quality, durable, and affordable lightsabers. Saber Masters is preparing to launch the Ultimate Lightsaber 2.0, and right now you can get two for the price of one. So, check out the link in our show notes and go get your Ultimate Lightsabers from Saber Masters. And don't forget to use our referral code STARDUST to save $10 at checkout. And each purchase using our referral code helps support Podcast Stardust. Hi, this is Emily Swallow, the armorer in The Mandalorian. You're listening to Dennis and Jay on Podcast Stardust. This is the way. Welcome back to Podcast Artists. This is the fully armed and operational podcast dedicated to Star Wars news, reviews, and discussion. I'm Dennis Keithley. And I'm Jay Krebs. And we are looking at another alternative Star Wars timeline in this episode with a discussion of Star Wars Infinity's Return of the Jedi. But before we dive into all those details, Jay, you want to remind everybody what our social media contacts are around the internet. My pleasure as always. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and X conveniently at Podcast Artists. Okay, the dish is aligned, the signal is boosted to maximum output, the shield is down, we are now broadcasting to the galaxy. And this is our discussion of Star Wars Infinity's Return of the Jedi. It's unfortunately the last Infinity story that we have out there. We previously covered A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back in the last couple of weeks. Uh, this story was originally published in November of 2023 and spilled over into, I'm sorry, November of 2003 and spilled over to November, or sometime in 2004. Script by Adam Gallardo, pencils by Ryan Benjamin, inks by Celine Crawford, colors Joel Benjamin, letters by Michael David Thomas, cover art by Rodolfo Migliari, designer Lonnie Shrewstein, and the editorial by Jeremy Barlow and Randy Stratley. So if you haven't catched our previous Infinities discussions, these comics feature the story of Star Wars, but then they make a twist to some portion of the stories and uh, a new hope Luke's torpedoes did not destroy the death star. And in the empire strikes back, Luke died on Hoth after he got away from the Wampa. He from his injuries and the freezing temperatures got the best of him and he perished in this story. Uh, we'll get into the twist in just a minute, but what did you think about this story overall, Jay on its own and in comparison to a new hope and the empire strikes back stories that they did? Well, going into it, just knowing that it was the last of the Infinity series was kind of sad. You know, I thought, mm -hmm. oh, you know, there's no more after this. I really wish that they would have come out with something for the prequel trilogy, because with this one coming out in 2003, I mean, we didn't even have Revenge of the Sith yet. You yeah. know, as we mentioned with the original A New Hope coming out uh, after The Phantom Menace, but before attack of the clones and then the empire strikes back was you know right around that time of attack of the clones so we're kind of in this timeline where there's so much more rich star wars history that we could tap into that could be thrown into these what if stories and as far as this particular one is concerned it was it was fun there were some twists that i was like oh gosh you know i was almost like thinking gosh this is really cheeky and, and and whatnot but then i thought to myself gosh there's other ones in here that could have really worked like mm -hmm. for real you know in return of the jedi so you know it was for me it was kind of at both ends of the spectrum but just like with the other two that we've reviewed and we've gotten a chance to enjoy i look at this as this is something that that i get to do you know and this is something that that i get to enjoy and I'm along for the ride. And as I've said with the other two, that you have to kind of take it at face value and just sort of, you know, let yourself be immersed into the story and just let yourself kind of ride the wave. And that's what I did. And I, I did really enjoy it. Yeah. So 
there's a key difference between this one and the A New Hope and the Empire Strikes Back story, which is the twist that we get, and we'll get into that in just a minute, takes place like essentially at what was the beginning of Return of the Jedi. And the entire story is contained within the Return of the Jedi time frame. Mm-hmm. Unlike A New Hope, where the twist takes place towards the end of that movie, and then it essentially gives us an alternate version of the events that we saw in Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. And in Empire Strikes Back, it expands the conclusion of that story out past the events of Empire Strikes Back, where this, I think you said it very well just a moment ago, it is, there's, it really just retells Return of the Jedi, taking into account this twist. Mm-hmm. And I kind of appreciate it about that, mm-hmm. you know, about this. So, you know, it, I think you said it very well. It's just a, this is really an alternate Return of the Jedi, whereas those others are, we changed something about those movies, and this is how everything would have unfolded afterwards, and not just the events of that movie. Right. And so I thought that was pretty cool here. There's two things I take issue with in this story, and we'll get to each of them in turn. Uh, but, uh, you know, so with that having been said, let's just dive into, you know, some more of the details here. And the first thing is, is the, the twist itself. And the story picks up at Jabba's palace, Leia's disguised as Boosh, and she's negotiating with Jabba to basically turn over Chewbacca. And in the movie, Jabba loses his temper and smacks C-3PO, and he just kind of falls over, and then he gets back up and he's covered in slime, and he goes back translating for Jabba. In this story, when Jabba goes to smack C-3PO, he hits him so hard that 3PO's head flies off. Mm-hmm. And he's incapable of getting back up and resuming his duties as a translator. And in the frustration between Jabba and Leia, things go awry. Leia reveals herself, which kind of struck me as odd. Mm-hmm. But then she pulls out the thermal detonator and it gets away from her. And it ends up blowing up 3PO. Boba Fett takes off with Han Solo still frozen in carbonite. And Jabba also gets caught in the explosion as well. So what did you think of the the twist? Well, this just goes to prove that communication barriers can have really bad repercussions Mm -hmm. or concussions, ha ha ha, as in missiles. But, you know, the, the thing that I did not like about this is the fact that as much grief, if you will, as the whole scene with Leia in the bikini gets as far as, you know, her being in that costume, I miss the part where she gets to strangle Jabba. And, you know, and for me, that was like a big part growing up that I was like, oh, you know, Leia is such a bad A, you know, kind of person. And this was just more of, of kind of a fumbling, bumbling kind of unfolding of events that was just chaotic in nature, but not very fluid. And things were just happening all over the place. And then, you know, Leia's trying to to blast her blaster as well. And she hits the the carbonite that Han is in and it damages it, you know, and then that goes forward with this whole thing. But, you know, of course I felt right away for a three PO. I'm like, oh yeah, poor guy. You know, because now he's gone and he gets blown up with the ship too. Right, and just like the previous two stories for A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, this is another one that could have used more panels, a couple more issues to cover some things because they don't really spend any time lamenting the loss of three PO in this story at all. Mm-hmm. No, and you also made mention that. You know, Le- Leia is chasing Boa Fett down as he's leaving with Han Solo and she's firing at him and she hits the carbon block and damages the controller, which ends up causing Han Solo's blindness to be permanent. Yeah. She never apologizes to Han for that no. in the story. And in fact, when they finally, and we're jumping ahead, when they finally get Han back to the rebel fleet and they thaw him and there's this notion, of, oh, you've got carbon sickness, uh, freezing sickness, your sight will return in time. She gets pulled aside and says, you know, the you know, this this thing was damaged. And so his blindness is going to be permanent. And you can kind of see that she's got some grief and some guilt about that. But she never discusses it with Han. And that seems strangely out of character in something that really needed to come up in this story for it to be complete. 
No, I completely agree with you. And Han even kind of accepts it sort of nonchalantly as well. I mean, he's still cracking just as many jokes just in a blindfold, you know, as he yeah. normally would. So, yeah, there was definitely that element that was missing of the the depth of relationship and emotion between Han and Leia and just just with Han in general, you know, as far as the way that he was approaching it. So it was it was almost like the characters were sort of compartmentalized instead of the way that they normally would interact. Yeah. The only exception to what you just said was I can't remember which one of the pieces of news it was that Leia got. And it was either the, I think it was like the message she got from Luke where Luke was disclosing, you know, Hey, you know, I had recorded this message. Leia, you're my sister. Vader's our father. And Han is blind. And he's like, where's Leia? Take me to her because he wanted to console her. Mm -hmm. And I like that was Han Solo yeah. Yeah, in that true. moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was pretty good. But again, I know they're dealing with space limitations here, but they wrote some things in the story that, okay, if you're, if you're going to write them in the story, then you have to form the space that they deserve. And so, sure. yeah, just, I felt like that, that needed more time and uh, needed to be fleshed out more. Mm -hmm. Oh, I agree. Okay. So some of the other plot changes that come after this is that, since Boba Fett gets away with Han after they leave Jabba's palace, they, they come near the sail barge, which I liked. I thought that was a fun little moment there. You know, we never get to the pit of Carcoon, so We never see the Sarlacc there, but they split up. Luke goes to Mos Eisley and Leia Chewbacca and Lando go to Mos Espa. And they're basically looking for contacts that might know where Fett is and how they can find him. But this delays Luke. And getting back to Dagobah, so Yoda dies before Luke can get there. Ultimately, it doesn't make that much of a difference, but what did you think about that? Well, one thing that really struck me about this particular whole scene is the fact that the Emperor actually senses Yoda's death, mm -hmm. which I thought was kind of a cool little twist because, you know, that wasn't the case, obviously, in the original movies so for him to have kind of this this intertwining of of force sensibility if you will you know with yoda that he was able to sense that was like i said it was kind of pretty i, I liked that that was cool i like that too but i have a side issue with it which is he doesn't quite break the fourth wall but he has this moment like wait a minute things aren't progressing the way that i thought they were going to he tells Darth Vader this, which is basically meant someone threw out the script, Vader. We were dealing uh -huh. with a new script. And so I need you to stay close to me. Uh huh. True. And then not only that, he knows where Yoda was and sends Vader to Dagobah to, you know, to see what's going on. Well, how did you possibly know that? It's one thing for him to sense Yoda's death, but how did he know, you know, you know, Yoda was on granted this story came out before Revenge of the Sith and we knew why it was that Yoda went to Dagobah and so the writers right. of this didn't have it but there's still no reason why the Emperor would know that Yoda was hiding there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point I hadn't thought about it that way yeah and the fact that with Revenge of the Sith like you said we know why Yoda went there right and then you know later in I, can't, I think it's like the fourth issue at one point the Emperor says to Vader's like you know I I paraphrasing you know I, I lost the thread there for a minute but now i see how things are unfolding and so it's like i don't know it, it just the i understand you know, always in motion the future is but it's almost like wink and a nod you all know what the story is but so, and i knew what the story was supposed to be but someone suddenly threw out the script and i don't get what's supposed to happen and i i, I that just didn't work for me in the story now that you explain it, like breaking the fourth wall, I, I have a completely different appreciation for this now. Yeah. <laughs> and you're right. Yeah. Now that I'm looking, like thinking back on it, I can totally see. And I think that was probably just a vehicle for the writers to be able to, you know, once again, rewrite this the way that they could. But you're right. Mm -hmm. Like the whole wink and nod thing, you know, that I think about it is is pretty blatant. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I just didn't feel like it was necessary uh, uh -huh. to the story. And in fact, I think it, it created a distraction where there shouldn't even have been one. Um, but anyway, so 
Vader goes off to Dagobah and Luke had just recorded this message for Leia, which I referenced a second ago saying, yeah. Oh, before we get to that. So Luke gets to Dagobah and instead of talking to Yoda as Yoda dies, he has a two on one conversation with the force ghosts of Obi-Wan Kenobi and Yoda. Mm -hmm. And they lay out everything for him then. And it's pretty much the same conversation without the difficulties of Yoda trying to choke off the words as he's dying. Um, I guess that worked for me, but did you have any other thoughts on that? Not really. I mean, it was, yeah, the whole, a Skywalker must confront Vader thing. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, like you said, it wasn't just choked out. It was just more of like a, almost like a business meeting between the three of them. Okay. But did a Skywalker see that was the other thing. I'm glad you said that a Skywalker must confront Vader. Did it, I, I don't know that I really came away from the original Star Wars trilogy thinking that it had to be a Skywalker that confronted Vader. It was that Luke was the last hope because he was the only like potential that had person that had potential to as a Jedi defeat Vader. Mm -hmm. Not the fact that he was a Skywalker. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you, you disagree? What do you think? No, I don't disagree. I think just from our understanding of, you know, the the idea of Anakin being the chosen one and that his children would be so powerful that being his offspring would kind of make sense that they would be the only ones that would be able to defeat him. So I guess I didn't really overthink that in this particular instance, mm -hmm. just, to, you know, in that in that way that it was just kind of like, oh, it makes sense that a Skywalker would have enough power to defeat Vader. Right. And see, I had read this story before. I think this was your first time reading it. It was. I, oh, yeah. yeah. But I read these stories when they originally came out all those years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I know where this was going. And so I was paying some particular attention to some of the stuff before. Mm -hmm. And knowing where the story ends, it makes me wonder if perhaps this, you know, whoever wrote the script didn't quite understand Star Wars the way we do. <laughs> so, and, mm. and just so put a pin in that for a second and we'll, we'll come back to that. So, you know, Luke sends that message to Leia via, you know, it's a hollow transmission that, you know, that breaks the news that you're my sister, Vader's our father. And then as he's leaving Dagobah, Vader's Star Destroyer shows up. And Luke gets caught in a tractor beam and taken aboard that way. And that's how Vader is going to take Luke to see the Emperor as opposed to capturing him on Endor. In fact, none of the big three, Luke, Leia, and Han, or Chewbacca, and the droids, make it to Endor. There is a different rebel team that goes down to Endor, which, hey, someone had to go do it. I don't have an issue with that. And we, we kind of skipped over the fact that Leia took Slave One after <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> from from, uh, from Boba Fett. And once they tracked him down to wherever he was, and they actually it was Boba Fett's armor that unlocked Slave One, so he his body had to get thrown onto Slave One. But so she's got it now, and when she finds out that Luke is being taken to the Emperor on the Death Star and Endor, she hops in Slave One and goes after him, and mm -hmm. flies that's where she probably gets captured. So the big climactic battle between Luke. And Vader in the Emperor's presence is complicated by Leia being there as well. And it is comes as a double whammy. L Vader doesn't have to pull that information out of Luke's head that he has a sister. It's right there in front of him that gets revealed. And it's like a major blow to him in that instance. Uh, what'd you think about that plot development? Well, it was interesting because when Leia was kind of brought before everyone, it was just sort of like, oh, okay, here it is, you know, mm -hmm. like, and, and it was kind of done that way throughout these different, you know, revenge or not revenge, this is sorry, uh, Empire Strikes Back and even A New Hope that there wasn't as much of the emotion. And we'd mentioned that before, too, that it didn't feel like it had the the gravitas that it had originally that it was just sort of like okay here we go this is it and ta-da this is the information mm -hmm. yeah yeah i again we're dealing with limited page space and limited panels i get that mm -hmm. but if they would have added a fifth issue i think they could eliminate oh, yeah. all of this stuff 
Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, this could have been it flowed a little bit more smoothly. Now, I gotta say, I do like the way that everything like unfolded on Endor. You know, the there's the Hans Pathfinders that that are are there. They're just without Han and company, and so they find the bunker and they basically walk into the trap. The stormtroopers, but <laughs> the Empire and their overzealousness to defeat them is shooting wildly and ends up hitting the Ewok village, which is what brings the Ewoks into the yeah. fight. And they're little murder bears, like yeah. <laughs> big time, because so they have that, no allegiance. Right, and the, that actually and worked for me uh, yeah. really well. I mean, yeah, the Ewoks came in, they started attacking both the rebels and the Empire. Exactly. <laughs> Stupid humans. <laughs> it was like, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, that worked. And then Lando doesn't lead the fight against the first Death Star. Instead, he and Chewbacca get onto the Falcon and Han insists on going with them. They fly down to Endor, and uh, the the, bunk, uh, the shield generator got damaged by one of the detonators of uh, the bombs that those rebels had, but didn't get completely destroyed. They take it out with a falcon. Mm-hmm. I like that twist. I thought that was really pretty cool. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. I, I I agree completely on that one. Mm-hmm. Here's where I really want to get your feedback. So we talked about this. You know, it's Luke uh, fighting Vader. Leia's there. The Emperor ends up like force lightnings her at one point. And then Vader basically throws down his saber and says, I'm not going to fight you anymore, father. You know, if you're going to do it, go ahead, strike us down. Strike. Are you, can you really strike down your children? And that's when Darth Vader can't do it. And he's actually lost an arm at this point. Mm-hmm. And Wedge leads the X-Wings into the star and it's about to blow up. So Vader's like, no, I can't do it. And Luke and Leia help carry him out of the Death Star and back to the Royal Fleet, and the Emperor escapes. So the movie doesn't end at the same place. The Empire is not defeated. The Death Star is blown up, right. but the rebellion has you know, rendezvoused again, and they're making their plans to track down the Emperor and hopefully dispose of him before the Empire can get its act together again. And Darth Vader shows up in all white armor and says, like, you know, maybe I can be of assistance in helping find my old master. And everyone's fine with that. I know. It's like, okay. I did like the the fact that, you know, Vader says, my children. That was That was pretty emotional, you know, that part of it. Because I was trying to kind of think about anakin inside you know there's always that that part of me that looks for anakin inside vader but you know yeah like you said when he just comes kind of strolling in in all white same exact kind of armor and i thought you know could you at least have like redesigned this instead of it just looking like you know you took some white shoe polish and just kind of went to town and you're right like mon mothma is just kind of standing shoulder to shoulder with him like nothing nothing nothing's different you know and this is all just completely okay because you know we've talked about this in the past that even if someone is redeemed would they really be able to atone for the sins of the past with the people that are left behind that remember all of the things that this person had done and in this case they obviously did (laughs) but in reality would they no And the fact that the emperor lives to fight another day, I think does lessen the idea of bringing that balance to the force. So I think that they're trying to achieve that by Vader coming back to the light, but it, that part of it just, it doesn't have the same, the same kind of gravity, you know, that the original does. It's like you and I podcasted together before. Uh, Yeah. I (laughs) agree with everything you just said. I liked this story overall. I, mm-hmm. for the reasons I said earlier, I like the fact that it was essential. It picked up at the beginning of the movie. It changed one thing. And then you had so many of those beats that repeated, even though this, the, the story unfolded a little differently, you know, the details shifted. It made sense that Yoda would die because Luke didn't get there in time, but they still right. were able to have the conversation because force ghosts exist in this world. It makes sense that the rebellion would have sent this other team of rebels there and they still could have possibly destroyed the shield generator. It worked the way they did all these things. And a lot of things that they did made sense. When I said stick a pen in the whole, I'm not sure that they understand Star Wars the way that we do. This is why. For those reasons that you just said, 
don't be calling him Darth Vader. Address him as Anakin yes. at this point. You know, for one thing, he's no longer a Sith Lord. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. Just turning his armor white, whipping out the spray paint and giving yeah. him a fresh coat. No, you know, he, he still looks menace. A, a color change is not enough. Give him, you know, that uniform was designed for a purpose to strike terror into the emperor's enemies. You know, how many times have we seen him as referred to as like the emperor's monstrosity right hand, you know, that, you know, whatever it is over time, give him a different appearance. But, you know, no way is Mon Mothma just be, oh, you got Anakin back. I mean, come Mm -hmm. on. This man is responsible or complicit in the destruction of worlds. And now we're just saying, oh, you turned over a new leaf. It's like professional wrestling when a wrestler goes from being (laughs) a heel to a face. And suddenly, (laughs) in the course of a week, all grievances are forgiven. And, you know, this guy can be counted on to do the right thing. So yeah. I don't know. That just that just did not work for me. I I like I actually like the idea that there could have been stories that unfolded from this, you know, that you know the emperor got away. And so now they you know they have to go after him. And it's kind of like the rebellion and the empire are going to be on more even footing because this star destroyer or the Death Star has been destroyed. And but you just can't have Vader out in front of everything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was a really missed opportunity to be able to use a lot of fun imagination on the part of these creators and just come up with something. I mean, this is a what if scenario. So just do something completely off the wall, you know, give Vader a completely new look instead of, you know, as we said, just, you know, giving him a fresh coat of paint. And you're right, because that was the whole purpose of him was to strike terror. And so yeah, I think that would have been so cool to be able to see something completely different. And I wonder if it was too far of a departure from the original character itself that maybe they just weren't willing to take that risk. Or, you know, I hate to say that it was a lazy decision because that's not fair, you know, but I, I do think it was a missed opportunity. Yeah. I mean, in The Empire Strikes Back Infinities, when Yoda is using the force to kind of mess with Anakin's mind, they change the appearance of Darth Vader's armor there. Mm-hmm. And I realize it's a different writer and that, you know, it's a different crew doing each one of these stories and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So you could do it. <laughs> I mean, you sure. could come up with something here. You could have come up with something that was softer, less menacing that actually looks like a Jedi. And there's all kinds of creative things. You know, you and I spend another 15 minute brainstorm. We kind of come up with a, something that worked there. But I don't know. It just was a, you need a conclusion for the story. I get that. But this just seems to, like you said, it it ignores what redemption means. It ignores what the consequences are for everything that happened. And I just, I just couldn't get on board with that. And it's just so abrupt the way it happens as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you know, uh, Lando fly, flies the Falcon up to the Death Star so they can retrieve Luke and Leia before the Death Star blows up. And, you know, here come Leia and Luke with Darth Vader between them. And it's like, help us get him on board. And Lando's kind of like, are you kidding? Okay, fine. And then they get him on board and Han can't see, but is wondering who they just dragged by. And then he hears Vader breathe. And he's like, wait a minute, is that who I thought it was? Yeah. yeah. And not to mention, okay, so Leia finds out that Vader's her father. But this is still the same guy that tortured her. Exactly. In A New Hope and blew up her adopted parents with the help of Grand Moff Tarkin. Mm-hmm. In her homeworld. And so it's just kind of like, oh, all's forgiven. So again, there's there was too many things missing from the story. The not addressing, she was responsible for making that shot that damaged the carbon that cost Han his eyesight. And then this, there's an entire conversation that has to happen here. And they skipped right over it about, you know, Vader's redemption. So. Right. Right. No, I totally agree. Yeah. Lando's about the only one that's like, wait, what's going on here? You know? Well, and Luke never got to have the conversation with Leia about there's still good in him. I can feel it. Yeah. And not only that, you know, and you remember what her reaction was in Return of the Jedi. It's like, you know, you know, run away, you know, she was 
mortified by this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now she just kind of puts it all behind her in the snap of a finger. Right, exactly. And that's what I mean by, you know, the the emotion that is missing, mm-hmm. which, you know, I realize that with a medium such as this, you don't have the luxury of the storytelling that you do in a movie. But again, I just think that there was a couple of missed opportunities and some things that just didn't kind of vibe quite right. Yeah, which is a shame because like I said, I, you know, I, I hadn't thought of Hut Slayer Leia being missing from this, but we talked about the Empire Strikes Back infinities where, you know, they skipped the asteroid belt mm-hmm. scene. And, you know, there was a number of key scenes and, you know, we didn't get the starlight pit and stuff like that. But so some things have to go in order to fit the story into four issues. But if you're going to do it, I don't know, just do it right. Give us give us the five, give us the six, give us the number of issues that it takes to tell this story. Uh, I feel yeah. like fans would have been there for it. So, yeah, it was a little rushed. Mm-hmm. Not a little, so, a lot. <laughs> So before I get on to some bigger questions about the Infinity stories as a whole, do you have any other thoughts on this one before we move on? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think we've hit pretty much everything, you know, as far as details and things like that go. Okay. So now that you've read all three of them, I, you, you said, you know, you're a little sad that they didn't make any more for like the prequels and stuff like that. But uh, which of the three was your favorite? Honestly, I really enjoyed A New Hope the best. And I don't know if it was just because it was new and novel and different. And I was just so excited to get into it. But I just feel like it had the most believability and just the most kind of fluidity between the way that the story was being told and the the characters and being true to what I thought, okay, well, if this twist would have happened, then yeah, I could see this happening. But one thing that I will say just overall as well is that going into this, I didn't realize that, you know, as you had mentioned earlier, that the story of A New Hope Infinities actually spans the entire original trilogy. Mm -hmm. I went into it thinking that A New Hope was going to only be reimagined as a new hope that the empire strikes back was only going to be reimagined as the empire strikes back where as we pointed out earlier and you said at the very beginning this is the only one that really kept just to the movie return of the jedi so Mm -hmm. i kind of went into it with a different sort of a of a expectation which didn't really change how much i liked or disliked it but i was a little confused like i was thinking to myself oh wait how is this going to lead in? But each one of them were their own separate story, not meant to be interconnected whatsoever. And so, um, so yeah, I figured it out, but I wish I would have known that going in because I would have had a little bit more of a, Oh, okay. I'm going to jump into this knowing that this could be intertwined. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get you. I mean, I kind of think about, uh, I've read a fair amount of like alternative history books in my uh-huh. time, you know, what if something had gone differently in the Revolutionary War or something ha- different happened in World War II or the Civil War? What would the outcome have been? And those stories usually, you know, span years, if not decades, telling you the differences and stuff like that. And and so there's that. I'm with you. I'd like to have seen them maybe do a new hope from earlier in the movie, change something there. I don't know exactly what, but, you know, the other ways that alternative history stories get told is – you change an element, not just kind of like a twist of fate type of thing. Like, you know, uh, there's like a classic civil war story where the plans for the uh, battle of Gettysburg get discovered early. And so that changes the outcome of the war or something like that. Mm -hmm. But like, what if it had been Leia that had been taken to Tatooine and Luke that had been delivered to Alderaan? Oh Yeah. Yeah, how would the story have unfolded then? You know, mm-hmm. you could do a new hope from that perspective. And oh, just sure. you just, you know, you could set it up with that as uh, you know, as we know the Revenge of the Sith, and then just skip ahead and have it suddenly Luke speeding towards Tatooine with the stolen plans, begging for General Kenobi's help. And what would have Leia on Ta- being raised on a moisture farm and ta- how all, how would that all unfolded differently? You know, what, what would it have been like for Leia to wander into the Mos Eisley Cantina with Obi-Wan Kenobi looking for a ride off that planet? How would Han have reacted differently in that situation? Um, you know, would Tarkin and Vader have treated Luke any differently than the way they treated Leia on the Death Star? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, 
Luke and Leia have a lot of similar qualities because they're twins, but there's enough differences. You know, how would Luke's role in a burgeoning rebellion have been had he been in Leia's place? Mm -hmm. So that's the type of story I would like to have seen at some point. And maybe they'll get around to writing something like that someday. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that would be a, a fantastic twist of fate for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I guess I didn't give my rankings. I think I agree with you. I think the new hope story was my, my favorite one. I think return of the Jedi was second for the reasons we stated, because again, it was contained within the bounds of that movie, even though I didn't like the end <laughs> with Darth Vader. Mm -hmm. um, and then Empire Strikes Back wasn't bad. It's just, um, yeah, it just it just had some flaws uh, when it came down to it. No, I would agree with that overall ranking as well. Same, right. same, same placings. All right. Any other thoughts on this before we call an episode? Uh, no, sorry to see it go. I really am. I mean, it was a lot of fun, but um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad we did it. All right. Well, if they ever get around to writing any more Infinity stories or some other what if story, we'll be there for it. So uh, prequels, prequels, prequels. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. Here's our fingers crossed. Okay. Yes. Well then thank you all for joining us for this episode of podcast artists and our discussion of star Wars infinity's return of the Jedi. We hope you enjoyed the discussion. And if you did, you can catch all of our future content by subscribing to podcast stars on your podcast of choice. Also like to remind you to find that you can find all episodes of the podcast over on nurturesapp.com, which is home to the entire network's worth of shows covering everything and geek culture from retro topics to Star Trek, uh, Animaniacs, and a whole lot more. As always, we greatly appreciate your five-star ratings and reviews on whatever podcatcher is that you use for your shows, and especially if that's Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to share the show and your favorite episodes on social media with your friends. So, Jay, you want to remind everybody what those contacts are one more time? Yes, indeed. And it's not a what if. It is a definite that you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and X at Podcast Stardust. And we also have a ton of fun Pinterest boards over on our Pinterest page. And we have two YouTube channels. So we have our traditional YouTube channel that has all of our shows. And then we are now on YouTube Music as well. So head over to both of those, like and subscribe. And if you're up for some real-time chatter, you can hit us up over on our Discord room, which is part of the RetroZap Discord server. So as Dennis was just mentioning about all the different shows, there's tons of pop culture geekery going on. So chances are you will find a room that will suit your fancy. And then we also have a couple of fun uh, places where you can get some swag and some products. So head over to our Tee Public store, which is tpublic.com slash user slash podcast stardust and you can pick from seven different show logo designs and if you do snag something you know that all of those sales do help to support the show and you can also help to support the show by checking out our collaboration with saber masters so right now you can pick up two of the ultimate lightsaber 2.0 versions of the saber master sabers which are really amazing high quality carbon sabers with tons of different features and those are right now selling for $199 for two. So you get two for the price of one. And if you enter the code Stardust at your checkout, you can also save an additional $10. And so we hope that you guys will all check that out. And if you do, please let us know. And um, we will definitely feature you on our social media as well, swinging around those lightsabers. So with that, Dennis, why don't you update everybody on some upcoming projects that you have going on or what else is going on in your world right now? So my wife, Beth, and I are eagerly awaiting the return of Star Trek Discovery in early April. And with that will be the return of Warp Trails, which is our podcast devoted to the new Star Trek that's been coming out on Paramount+. Plus. And you can find that on the RetroZap podcast feed and just go to your podcast of choice, look for RetroZap, and you'll find all the episodes as they come out there. If you want to find our past episodes, just go over to RetroZap.com, look for the Warp Trails page, and you can find our discussions on earlier seasons of Discovery, Lower Decks, Picard, and Strange New Worlds. So, Jay, I know you've been keeping busy with your hobbies. What is the latest in the world of cosplay? All right. Well, as usual, you can catch me on my Instagram, which is at j.snipscosplay. And I'm over there as Ahsoka, two different versions of Hera, the fourth sister Inquisitor from the Obi-Wan Kenobi, and currently working on my Mandalorian for April. Fan Expo Cleveland is where I'm hoping to debut that. And every once in a while, I sprinkle in some Leia and some other fun things as well. So um, check that out once again, j.snipscosplay. 
All right, upcoming on the show this Friday for episode 700. We'll be getting into the next episode of The Bad Batch. And then on Monday, it's time for another look at Star Wars News. So, with that having been said, thanks for listening to episode 699 of Podcast Stars, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. And until next time, may the Force be with you.